Yes, uh, welcome to the second talk of uh, today's ICU Christian uh, International Christian Linguistic uh, International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. Uh, let me introduce the second speaker, uh, uh, Claire Halpert. Uh, Claire is Associate Professor of Linguistic at University of Minnesota. Uh, she works mainly on syntax, focusing on the interaction between nominals and predicates, and she looks at like case, agreement, and uh, movement related issues. Uh, her research focuses on Zulu and other Bantu languages, and uh, that's why I'm also very excited about today's talk, because I will also work on <laughs> Southern Bantu languages. And um, she's in also uh, 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 interested in the syntax prosody interface, and in particular, uh, the focus interaction in the grammar with the other parts of the grammar. Uh, uh, I think our past course multiple times at ACL or like some African linguistic conference, so it's uh, it's really good uh, to hear uh, you, uh, to have you here. And uh, today we are going to have Claire uh, here, Claire talking about revisiting nominal licensing in Zulu. It's good to have you here today. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for having me. It's, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very excited to hear about um, the Bentu Prosody project that's uh, going on there. So I'll definitely be following uh, what comes out. I just put uh, my handout into the chat. If you are a person who uh, likes to follow along on your own terms, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, but, but I was yeah, in the yeah, middle from before. Page. Okay, yeah. now we're good. <laughs> yes. um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my thumbnail set up right. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm talking today about a lot of those uh, issues that um, Dr. Lee mentioned in the introduction. And uh, the plan here, I was thinking about the, the theme of uh, trends in African linguistics. And one uh, question that has um, lately been getting a lot of attention because it is, I think, raises a lot of interesting issues is this question of um, what on earth should we say about uh, nominal licensing in Bantu languages? So uh, put another way, a lot of researchers lately have been worrying about um, whether Bantu languages have case and if so, how do they uh, do case? Um, and this might seem like a question that should be pretty straightforward to evaluate or self-evident, um, but you can see here from the definitely non-exhaustive list of answers uh, that there's something going on that's tricky about this. So one um, proposal that was originally floated um, in Carolyn Harfer's dissertation uh, and revived um, by Mike Dierks more recently uh, is perhaps um, that Bantu languages uh, do not have something like the case filter. They don't do case at all. Uh, there's another line of inquiry that says maybe um, Bantu, Bantu languages have nominal licensing, but um, it's not linked to something like phi agreement, unlike what we find um, in many, many other languages. Uh, we have people saying in some Bantu languages, you see a connection between agreement and nominal licensing. Um, you see uh, in my own work and recent work by Aja Petrashko, the idea that uh, maybe there is nominal licensing that happens at a very, very local level, sort of where we're not used to seeing it. Um, there's work um, by uh, Shannon Vanderwall, Carson Zemleche, and um, others that argue that maybe what is equivalent to case in Bantu languages is actually really done um, in uh, the domain of information structure. So you see that there's a lot of answers to what ought to be a pretty straightforward question. Um, and uh, so we wanna think about why it's so difficult um, to answer this question. And, um, you know, off the bat, we can see, we'll look at a lot of um, data in a second, but you already saw from Ken's talk, basically in uh, Bantu languages, you don't typically get morphological case alternations so things can appear in subject position as direct objects, as indirect objects, and they're all going to be identically non-marked. Um, you get nominals showing up in sort of unusual configurations where we don't typically 
uh, C nominals in other languages, including as subjects of finite clauses, as subjects that will hyperraise out of uh, finite clauses, subjects of non-finite clauses, excuse me, um, in what is typically called inversion constructions, where a locative or an object will show up in the canonical subject position, control subject agreement. Um, and so all of these things taken together um, yields a picture that's sort of hard to read into our classic understanding about how case works. Uh, so what I wanted to do today um, is to sort of revisit uh, part of the picture in Zulu and what we know about um, nominal licensing. And in particular, I'm gonna focus just on um, a subset of that picture, which is the behavior of uh, loosely construed external arguments. And I'm gonna show you that in a variety of environments um, in Zulu that we believe would be case deprived in other languages, um, external arguments start to behave funny. And that kind of suggests that they may be um, requiring structural licensing in Zulu too. Um, and so what we'll do first, I'll give you a little bit of a, a sense of how I think uh, we want to go looking for evidence um, in Zulu and other Bantu languages, because uh, as that uh, just sort of brief um, look at the literature suggests, it's certainly not trivial to address this question. Um, and then we'll take a tour of some uh, particular uh, phenomena in Zulu that I think are really informative in thinking about this question. Um, so where should we look if we want to know whether uh, nominal licensing is required, morphosyntactic licensing of nominals is required in a language? Um, so here I'm taking Mark Baker's sort of working definition, structural case is the sort of case where, where we expect structural factors to be the most relevant and semantic factors to be the least relevant. Uh, and I think it's important to kind of cast it in these broad terms uh, because it opens us up beyond just thinking about uh, say nominative accusative or even ergative absolutive, the sorts of um, pictures where we believe case is very closely linked with certain positions. We need to kind of uh, keep an open mind about where we might find it. Um, and in that vein, recent work by Michelle Sheehan and Yannicka Vanderval uh, suggests that we move away from the term case altogether and um, use instead uh, something that uh, David Pazetsky suggested, which is to call it vernial licensing um, uh, in honor of that sort of initial observation that something about the structural licensing, uh, at least in some languages, tracks pretty closely with morphological case. So, um, in Sheehan and Vanderwall's terms, uh, Vanuola licensing is um, the phenomenon that overt referential DPs are restricted in their distribution in cross-linguistically stable ways, right? So there's something about nominals um, where their syntactic um, licensing is governed in predictably cross-linguistically stable ways. Uh, and these distributional Restrictions can hold in languages that have no obvious case morphology, and they can be governed by different syntactic factors than we would typically assume to be involved in abstract case. And if you look at, um, again, back at the lit review uh, for how people have thought about case in Bantu, you see all of those things, right? The idea that um, things other than case morphology, other than um, by agreement, uh, maybe even stuff like um, information structure might be playing the role of this kind of structural licensing. So um, just quickly at the bottom of the page, uh, Shannon and Vanderbilt uh, provide a number of diagnostics to help you uh, determine whether a language has something like this kind of licensing. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them here, but the three that are highlighted in bold are going to be three that we'll pay a little bit more attention to. Uh, so finiteness, um, if DPs can survive as non-finite subjects, then maybe they weren't being licensed by finiteness. And we know that finiteness is a very cross-linguistically robust means of licensing, usually associated with what we call nominative case. Um, passive agents is another place they look. Uh, if an agent DP can survive in a passive construction without special morphological marking, then it might not need licensing in either the passive or the active. Um, and that's associated with what we tend to think of as accusative case cross-linguistically. And then more generally, 
um, if DPs pattern differently as the arguments of a coherent class of categories, so something like um, DPs that are arguments of V behave differently than DPs that are arguments of N, uh, then we might um, want to tie that to um, a differentiated nature of categories. So some categories in the language are licensors and others might not be. Um, and what we're going to see in all of these respects uh, is that this is where Zulu does seem to show some of these hallmarks of structural licensing in actually a fairly um, predictable way, though with some twists. Uh, in the non-highlighted areas, which I will say a little bit about, but I won't um, dwell on too much, that's where we see the behavior um, that is not expected from um, the point of view of this kind of standard mechanisms for licensing. So uh, today what we're going to do, we're going to look at some basic properties of Zulu nominals, um, Zulu agreement, and Zulu movement. And um, I'll probably go fairly quickly through this. I'm sort of going to assume uh, that um, you've seen a fair number of Bantu languages in this talk series, including earlier um, tonight. But you can certainly uh, jump in with a question um, if something goes by too quickly. Uh, and then once we've done that, we'll look at the places where nominals are um, sort of behaving the way we might expect uh, from a view of that this language has uh, structural licensing. So three places where nominals stro show structurally restricted distribution, um, sort of associative, so-called associative, possessive constructions, uh, passives, and uncontrolled infinitives. Uh, I'm going to argue that what we find here is structural licensing effects with some twists. So you can't just apply your out of the box uh, case theory that you learn in a syntax class. We have to um, have a little bit more nuance when we look at Zulu. Uh, and so essentially what I'm going to say is that um, the patterns that we'll talk about in these um, possessive, passive, and uncontrolled infinitive environments are the effects of uh, structural licensing or case being uh, yanked away. So even if it's really hard to see that it was happening in the first place, we can recognize it in its absence. All right, so here we go. So uh, section two, this is uh, going to go by fairly quickly. This is just the basics of um, agreement in this language so we can kind of navigate the constructions that are to come. So Zulu is not at all unusual in the Bantu language family in that you find obligatory subject agreement morphology on every single um, finite verb you encounter and optional object agreement morphology. So in Zulu, um, agreement tracks VP external arguments only. So only if an argument either moves out of its uh, base position or is prodropped will you find uh, agreement with that argument. If the subject stays in C2, stays in its uh, specifier of little VP position, uh, it will not agree. You'll just get this expletive um, who marker uh, appearing in those things. And object agreement will only appear if the object is prodrop or VP external. So unlike subject agreement, there's no expletive counterpart. Um, but it, like subject agreement, it only tracks things that have moved out of the VP. And this is what you see in three, four, and five. So three, if you have preverbal or prodropped um, subjects, you get agreement. And uh, the way to navigate this in um, Zulu and other Bantu languages is to follow the numbers on the nouns and see what they match up with. Um, if that same subject, so in 3a, uzinche ukovu dekoi, uzinche is making steam bread, you have a preverbal or prodropped subject that controls agreement in four. If that subject stays inside little VP, um, you cannot have the agreement, you must have the coup. And the object, um, as you may have seen in three, uh, A and B did not agree, but if you move that object to a higher position as in five, um, you get this agreement marker here. Um, Zulu is uh, pretty permissive of low subjects, so you can have transitive expletive, you can have ditransitive expletives, we'll see those um, in a bit. And when the subject stays inside little VP in these transitive expletive constructions, it essentially traps all of the lower arguments. So when the subject is low, everything else stays low. They cannot control subject agreement, they cannot control object agreement. And this is gonna be um, important to remember 
later when we look at passives and infinitives. So this is what we see um, in six. So if you have a base sentence like Sipo cooked eggs, uh, you have a low subject followed by the object. Uh, and that's the only way you can do this. If the subject stays low, the object is just stuck there. It can't agree, it can't move. Um, and seven shows the same thing with a ditransitive. So you get this predictable rigid word order, verb, subject, indirect object, and direct object. Um, and I've argued elsewhere that that reflects the base position of argument inside VP. So agreement correlates with movement. Uh, low subjects block everything else from agreeing or moving. Uh, and it's very, very clear from this that arguments don't need agreement in order to be structurally licensed. All of these um, transitive expletives and ditransitive expletives are perfectly happy and grammatical, even if no agreement has occurred. I'm going to skip over section 2.1, but it just illustrates again that whatever we say about licensing uh, doesn't seem to be linked to agreement in any way because we have a lot of hyperactivity in this language. You can um, raise out of finite positions, you can agree all over the place. Uh, so I won't go into that here. I'm happy to take questions about it. But if we move to the middle of page six, uh, we can sort of see the initial picture. Um, Zulu has a strong correlation between movement and agreement, but not between movement uh, and licensing. And we see effects of locality and intervention everywhere. Um, and again, as I said, all of this is in line with uh, Shane and Vanderbilt's observation uh, that languages that lack abstract nominal licensing don't have a link between um, agreement and licensing. Uh, so what we find in Zulu is um, certainly compatible with not having licensing, but it's not the same as proof that there's no licensing. Um, if we then turn and look at um, the nominal domain, the picture looks a little bit different. It actually looks a little bit more um, familiar. So inside of nominals, there's essentially a straightforward all-purpose morphological strategy um, for marking ad nominal dependence. Uh, so any nominal that shows up inside a larger nominal um, is going to be marked with what is called the associative. Uh, it's a complex two-part prefix. It has a nominal concord that matches the head noun and a um, head ah that will coalesce with the vowel of the noun that it marks. And I show you a little bit of um, associative arithmetic in the examples below. But what you see in 10 through 12 uh, is that the associative can do a variety of functions, essentially. So all different types of ad nominal dependence. Uh, so it's marked possessors. Uh, so Unkovu Wum Tagat is the wizard's zombie, and it's literally zombie a wizard, something like that with the associative. Uh, it marks um, nominal modifiers, uh, like this kind of partitive strategy. So Isminya Minas and Unkovu is a horde of zombies. Um, and it can mark the internal argument of a low nominalization. So uh, the noun um kabango is uh, derived from a verb kabanga think. We'll see it later, I think. Um, and the thought of zombies has this associative mark um kabango we um, And you can stack these things up. You can have multiple nominal modifiers of various types inside the same noun phrase, and they're each going to get their own little associative morpheme with the concord on it. So isminya minas and kovu som tagati. Uh, the wizard's horde of zombies, um, now you have two ad nominal dependents. Uh, in some recent work, Aja Pietraszko has an, analyzed um, analogous constructions in Ndebele, which is very closely related, as involving a concord process uh, that's sketched out for you um, in 14. So she analyzes the, um, the ah head uh, as some sort of uh, linker takes a modifying DP as its complement, and then the five features of the uh, head noun are copied onto the linker as some kind of DP internal concord process. This is what we see in 14 uh, for Isminya Minas and Kuvu, a horde of zombies. Um, and for the even more complicated process, you can essentially just keep iterating these adjunct uh, linker phrases. So it seems to mark nominal adjuncts to a nominal. You can have as many as you want. And 
they're completely compatible with a very wide range of um, semantic relationships. And so at this point, you could ask, well, what is it doing there? Is this some kind of thematic licensing that's happening by means of uh, the nominal? Is it some kind of structural licensing? Is it doing both? Is it doing neither? Um, and uh, one way to make a little headway on this is to look at um, a phenomenon that has not been very well described or investigated. And in fact, I don't have that much uh, information about it beyond what you see here. So if you have detailed questions, um, my answer will probably be, well, that's a very good question. Uh, but what we know about unmarked possession um, in Zulu uh, is that certain possessors um, roughly fitting into this class of concerny concern type constructions, uh, you can have immediately preceding the possessee with no associative. So instead of the associative construction where the possessor follows and is marked with this morphology, here it's bare and it proceeds. So if you want to say something like, I broke the boy's arm, and these sort of body part ones are a pretty common way to do it, uh, you would say, Gipule umfana ingalo, where it's just, I broke boy arm. Um, and 15 is an B is another example. Um, and whatever this construction is, it looks like it's sticking very close to the possessee. Uh, so in 16 um, A and B, uh, so 16 ukusulum vano bu, so to wipe the boy's face. Again, you have this unmarked strategy, boy face. Um, in 16 B, if we add an indirect object, ukusulela ugogo umfano bu, so um, you add the um, applied argument uh, grandmother as a benefactive, uh, then the um, boy face still stays together as, um, you know, as a contiguous unit. But uh, other than that, you know, in this base construction, they look like they're quite closely linked. What we find is that um, otherwise the possessor sort of has a somewhat argument like behavior in the matrix clause. So they can act like uh, goals for various types of processes in the matrix predicate. So in 17, what we see is that you can essentially get possessor raising to the agreeing subject position in unaccusatives and passives. So if you want to say the pig's leg is broken, what you literally say is um, the pig is broken leg, um, or my heart was broken um, with an optional agent there. Uh, it's um, literally, I was broken heart. Um, and uh, similarly, the possessor alone can control object agreement in transitives. And one thing that's quite interesting about these constructions is that they're completely asymmetrical. So the possessee cannot raise and cannot control agreement. This is what we see in 19 and 20. If you try to do arm agreement um, in that broken arm scenario, uh, you get ungrammaticality. Um, and that might not seem like a big deal, but in the context of uh, Bantu languages and um, Zulu, it's uh, striking because in double object constructions, for example, uh, you get symmetricality. So either an IO um, indirect object or a direct object could do these processes. So the fact that we get no symmetricality here uh, means that there's something um, unusual. So uh, in particular, these unmarked possessors don't behave like true arguments Arguments of the verb um, with respect to symmetricality uh, and some other factors. So we probably want to rule out a control analysis. We don't want to say that they're literally um, arguments of the matrix verb, uh, but rather uh, this may be a good candidate for something like raising. So the possessor might begin inside the nominal uh, and raise out and be a goal for various A processes. Um, and this is kind of the signature of a case type pattern, right? So the absence of morphological marking um, yields syntactic movement and some sort of connectivity in the main clause looks, that looks like case. So it looks like maybe, um, you know, it can remain inside the VP. Those are the base cases. It doesn't show the typical ref, uh, flexibility with respect to movement and agreement. So if something, moves or agrees, it must be that possessor, not the possessee. Um, so if we looked just inside nominals in Zulu, we might not have 
uh, thought that anything was amiss with respect to case in the first place, right? So um, as predicted in a case deprived environment, um, we need some kind of morphological strategy to license nouns. This is exactly what we see cross-linguistically in lots of types of nominals. You have some kind of alternate strategy like propositional phrases or genitives or uh, other of those kind of ad nominal cases. And here we have the associative. When you take away the associative um, inside a nominal, you get these extra syntactic connectivity effects with the main clause. So it looks like something has to be going on there. Um, and one possible interpretation is that that's something like structural licensing. So this fits with um, how Sheen and Van der Waal uh, characterize um, assigners with respect to structural licensing. Uh, we expect an alternate licensing strategy to pop up with cross-linguistically predictable categories, and N is definitely one of those categories. Um, so the other places that I want to look um, are going to kind of yield a fairly similar conclusion. If we keep looking at environments that we expect to be case deprived in a language like English, uh, we'll find other patterns that look more familiar than the sort of very basic facts that we saw in section two would suggest. Um, so first, what we'll see in both passives and uncontrolled infinitives is that the external argument um, is optional. And when it's expressed, it requires specific morphological marking. Uh, this is what we see in 21 with um, passives and 22 with infinitives. So in 21, we have lelumini, labulawa, yizingane. So the window is broken. Uh, if you have yizingane, um, the argument, um, you can see that English does it with a biphrase. Zulu does it with a copula, but it has this morphological marking on the optional external argument. Uh, in an infinitive, um, something similar. So um, something like for you to run is better, your running is better, or some you know, people will give it translations like that. If you have that um, agent there, you have to mark it with an associative, like we just saw in that previous section. Um, and one possibility that you might uh, entertain just looking on the basis of these two examples um, is that these strategies are just a way to introduce these external arguments as an adjunct. So uh, they're optional. So you might think that they're not part of the argument structure of the predicate. You need an additional strategy to get them in. Um, and something like the associative or the copula is going to do the trick. I'm going to argue here that uh, we don't want to go down that route. We want to consider these external arguments to be true arguments of the verb. Uh, and therefore the morphology has to reflect something else. It's not just an adjunct strategy. Um, and I'm going to say that these uh, look like the effects of case deprivation. Um, and um, in particular, what I'm going to argue is that in both of these constructions, we wanna treat them um, in parallel. The optional agent is sitting in spec little VP, sort of the typical um, uh, location where external arguments emerged. We can't treat it as an adjunct. And it, unlike um, external arguments in finite transitive clauses, uh, it's a non-intervener for other A processes for things like movement and agreement. Um, and uh, so once we go through the data on passives and uncontrolled infinitives, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll agree with me that it makes sense to treat these two things as birds of a feather. Um, and the original work that I was doing on passives is um, uh, joint work with Jochen Zeller um, that we had presented in 2016. And so I'm reporting on some of that and then extending it um, a bit more here. So we saw that passive external arguments, uh, when they appear, they're marked with a copula. And um, when we poke around at them, we know that they can appear in a pretty low position. So they're not, um, they're clearly not just high adjuncts because they can appear inside the verb phrase with the morphology that tells us that they're um, inside little VP roughly. So they appear without the disjoint morphology. This is what we see in 23. Um, so if we say many animals are killed with scientists, the form of the verb killed tells us that um, that, that external argument has to be 
at least somewhere inside little bp. Um, what becomes even more striking is that when we do passives of ditransitives and we express the external argument, um, it appears uh, between the verb and the remaining internal argument. So this is 24, Sipo was given a book by Mary. Uh, you get Usipo wa nigezwa umeri mwadi. So um, the agent, the external argument, Mary, precedes the remaining internal argument book. And book is not agreeing. And you can remember that non agreeing things are inside little VP. Um, so it's inside little VP in its base position and preceded by the external argument. Um, that looks exactly like the word order that we have in a transitive expletive. You get external argument that followed by the internal arguments. Um, furthermore, when we investigate things like quantifier binding, uh, we get evidence that these external arguments are able to see command other things inside little VP. Um, so uh, this is what we see in 27. Uh, I'm going to skip the 25, um, which is the baseline case, just showing that C command um, seems to go with binding. In 27, Tembe um, was Tembe was given um, his picture by every boy. That his picture uh, can be bound by every boy, which in Zulu precedes his picture. Um, so the bound reading is possible. It looks like there's C command. Um, but the really um, big difference between this and a transitive expletive um, is that having the overt external argument there inside little VP preceding other arguments and C commanding them somehow does not prevent external internal arguments from getting out of little VP, right? So we're still promoting an internal argument around that external argument, unlike in a transitive expletive where nobody can get out. Um, so that's the basic case with passives. Um, if we look at the uncontrolled infinitives, uh, some very quick basics, they look uh, verby on the inside, nouny on the outside. So what does that mean? They have uh, noun class morphology um, of class 15, but they show up in contexts where infinitives are cross-linguistically common. So 28, uh, I want to make steam bread. You have this uh, to make steam bread thing um, with this uku morphology, uh, I hope to see you all. You have this uku thing, uh, you have C, uh, and then you have things like um, object agreement showing up inside this infinitive. So from the inside, they look like verbs. Uku attaches to any amount of clause structure up to the point of subject agreement. But from the outside, they look like nominals. And in fact, um, they can control subject and object agreement even when they get these sort of control type readings like in 30. Um, so in environments where we typically find uncontrolled pro, um, Zulu permits an overt external argument to appear as we saw before. And that argument is typically marked with uh, associative morphology that um, matches the infinitive itself. This is, again, uh, what we saw previously. So um, for you to run makes me happy. Um, but infinitives don't really treat their other arguments like um, associative deploying nominals, right? So we saw already um, that in low nominalizations, all uh, you just sort of mark all of your arguments um, arguments with associative. Um, but in these uku infinitives, internal arguments essentially never get marked. So I wish to get a degree. Um, there's nothing on degree as an internal argument. Um, if you have your wish uh, to get a degree, um, you take that verb wish, you turn it into a nominal, um, then the wisher and the thing wished both get associative. Uh, so you can see when you flip that into um, a low nominalization, you get associative all around. Infinitives uh, only do that for external arguments. Um, low nominalizations also differ from infinitives. They don't allow binding. 
um, external arguments in low infinitives can't bind into internal arguments. This is uh, 33. Um, but, uh, uh, and so you might expect that um, the UCU clauses are just going to be exactly like low nominalizations. Um, and so the external argument is some kind of um, adjunct that attaches outside of the entire nominalization. Uh, when we have um, a number of associative mark adjuncts modifying a nominal, they typically have fairly free word order with some uh, quirks that I won't get into. Uh, but we might expect an associative marked external argument to appear after all the internal arguments of infinitives because those things are unmarked, right? They seem to be inside the nominalization. Uh, but that's not what happens in Zulu. This is what we get in 35. So if we have something like for him to give the children vuvuzelas uh, annoys me, um, so you get uh, infinitive give associative him, children, vuvuzelas. So both of those internal arguments follow the associative mark external argument. Um, and uh, speakers tend to not like the other word order. So you get the rigid word order that is exactly what we find in transitive expletives and ditransitive expletives. And what's more, you get the same kind of C command evidence that we saw with passives. This associative marked external argument can bind into internal arguments. Um, which directly contrasts with the examples we saw a little bit ago. This is what we see in 36. Um, so the conclusion that I think all of this suggests is just like with the passives, these external arguments in the uncontrolled infinitives are inside little vp, um, probably in their base position because of the C command facts, but just like with the passives, they don't intervene. Uh, so um, with infinitives, you're not going to see subject agreement, but you're going to see object agreement. And an internal argument can control object agreement even when that external argument is present inside little vp. This is 37. So, so him giving them vuvuzelas annoys me. So we have the external argument, but we have class 10 object marking um, on the infinitive. And this is like the passives, but it's unlike the transitive expletives, which is repeated in 38. Um, so we have this common profile, right? Overt external arguments and passives and infinitives are VP internal. They precede other arguments inside the VP and they bind into those arguments. Uh, so I think that the most reasonable conclusion that we should draw about these is that they're just overt agents in spec little VP uh, exactly where they're born in any other kind of clause. Um, but if we come to that conclusion, we then have a number of open puzzles. Uh, and in particular, uh, we want to know uh, why do they get the marking that they get? Why do they get the copula or the associative? Why do they not intervene for lower arguments? And um, what makes them optional in these cases? And we can also ask, what does it mean for case and licensing? So as I uh, mentioned in the introduction, these are two kind of hallmark places where we want to look for structural licensing. Um, and Zulu does not, in fact, fit the predictions of a language that has no licensing. So it does something really funny uh, to the external arguments of passives. It marks them morphologically. Uh, and there's a number of um, very particular structural things that go along with that, and the same with the infinitives. So Zulu is clearly restricting both the position and the marking of these um, external arguments, and that looks like a hallmark of being no licensing. So uh, just very uh, quickly before I wrap up, I won't get into the details too much, but I want to sketch for you uh, the kind of story that I have in mind uh, to talk about these. And in particular, um, I want to take very seriously the fact that we get uh, the morphology that we get in these places. So. Um, Associative morphology on the external argument of um, the infinitives is maybe not that surprising because, uh, as we've seen, there's evidence that these uncontrolled infinitives are pretty nouny at the top, right? They have five features, they'll agree. Uh, so we get the ad nominal dependent marking strategy that kind of makes sense. Uh, the copula is more mysterious and it's pretty typologically unusual, even within the Bantu family. There's just a handful of, uh, as far as I know, just Southern Bantu languages that do this at all. Um, 
And I think uh, Axel Fleisch has some work on, on which languages in particular, but it's not that many. Uh, it's not something that we find marking obliques or adjuncts in any other circumstances that I'm aware of. And we have all sorts of like, locative and instrumental morphology um, that ought to track pretty closely to your standard biphrase strategy. And that's in fact what we get in a lot of other Bantu languages. You, um, you get the sort of with or and or instrumental marker kind of um, morphology showing up. Um, but I think that makes all the more reason to treat these things in tandem um, because, uh, and here I'm going to just uh, zip really quickly through, but basically um, what both these elements have been analyzed as in other circumstances, as we saw with the associative, uh, Petrashko treats that as some kind of um, linker strategy. And um, we know from other Bantu languages that linkers and copulas are either very, very closely linked or in fact, uh, essentially versions of the same thing. And here I'm gonna build in particular on Baker and Collins' work in Kinande. They argued that uh, there's some linker morphology that is an a-categorial head that's involved in licensing. Um, Schneider Zeuga also in Kinande argues that um, the linker is uh, essentially a copula. Uh, so the sort of aggregate properties is that there's some kind of uh, nonverbal head. Um, it shows up in the clausal spine. It can be high in the postverbal field. Um, and it's somehow involved in licensing. Uh, in the work that Jochen Zeller and I did originally on the passive, we noted the similarity with the Kanande linker um, and the Zulu passive agent constructions um, and suggested that uh, maybe this uh, copula, this predication head was doing something very similar. Um, this actually looks a lot like uh, Petrashko's treatment of the linker in the nominal domain uh, except for her um, ad nominal, um, or yeah, uh, linkers in the nominal domain are adjuncts. For me, they would still have to be in the causal spine. Um, so what I want to say is going on here is that uh, Zulu infinitives with overt agents, you have a linker um, phrase in basically the same place that it is in the passive phrase, but then um, at the end of the day, if uh, the infinitive is formed and the whole thing nominalizes, the morphology of that linker gets spelled out um, as associative. When, um, but if it stays a verb, like in the passive, it gets spelled out as the copula. Um, this is, yep, yeah, this is what I sketch on page 19. Uh, there's essentially there's evidence all over the all over Bantu, but also other places in uh, Zulu that we need this kind of head in roughly that place. So um, in his work on uh, semantic locative inversion 2013, Jochen Zeller argues that you have something like the linker phrase, or in fact, a linker phrase just above um, little VP, kind of exactly where we find it in these passive and infinitive constructions. Um, and, and it introduces uh, the possibility of semantic locative inversion. Um, what uh, I've recently been thinking about but haven't had time to weave in is that in an, um, Leston Buell's work, he notes that semantic locative inversion is uh, yet another place in Zulu where external arguments become optional. So just like in um, passives, just like in infinitives, uh, the external argument does not need to be expressed. And that is its own set of questions. What is it about um, these uh, constructions that permits a, you know, a fully null external argument. Um, if you have, um, haven't seen semantic locative inversion, uh, it doesn't look like the classic Bantu locative inversion in that you don't get locative morphology, uh, you just get the um, locative argument appearing uh, as a plain nominal, but you get the locative interpretation. So, uh, handicapped children study at the school. It's literally this school is studied um, children, right? But uh, the point in uh, 45b is important. You can also just say the school is studied at. Um, so normally study has to have the external argument. It's not a passive here. 
but the external argument is um, completely dropped. So just to wrap up really quickly, um, what does it all mean? Uh, we've seen a number of places where we might be getting uh, case effects in Zulu. And I think this is a partial set of the cases where we might be getting case effects. Um, but uh, for our purposes today, we've seen this uh, licensing via some kind of linker type strategy that shows up um, in a variety of environments. So any kind of nominal that you get, any external argument that you get in these um, environments are gonna be licensed via this uh, linker strategy. Uh, and so if we require some kind of licensing in um, passives and uncontrolled infinitives and associatives, then we must also uh, be licensing our nominals in their counterparts, uh, in the uh, bare possession cases, in active transitive clauses, right? So we still don't necessarily have a good handle on what that licensing is, because as we saw in section two, it doesn't seem to be agreement. Um, so what I give you in the middle of page 20 here is just looking at uh, Sheehan and Van der Waals diagnostics and seeing how they play out in Zulu. Um, T agreement and activity uh, all both uh, look like um, not your typical case structural licensing behavior. But then when we look at things like uncontrolled infinitives, passives, uh, possessor raising, and uh, categories, assigner categories, we start to see something more typical. So I've been focusing in this entire talk on the licensing that happens in these funny deprived environments, um, but we still need to figure out how licensing is happening under the normal circumstances. And thinking way back to the introduction uh, and all of those varied answers to the question of whether Bantu languages even have case in the first place, um, there's good reason why people went down that road. And it means that there's still a lot of work to do to figure out what the typical licensing strategy is. And I will leave it there. Thank you. This, is, this was great. <laughs> also, uh, uh, some of the topics that I'm interested in uh, looking at. So, uh, do we, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, do you, uh, anyone who have who has a question, please uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask question. Or yeah, Ken, please. Hi. Uh, Hi. Since I've heard this something. Not all of this, but some of this before. Uh, I actually, it, it started some thinking in my mind about uh, um, an old puzzle that I corresponded with you a little bit about, uh, which is yeah. that you get the uh, these uh, nominalized uh, infinitives uh, with associative arguments, and the uh, nominalized infinitive has a reflexive marker on it that C commands uh, the associative argument. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I think I've come to some very similar con conclusions, uh, not about linkers so much, but about whether or not the associative argument is, uh, uh, I think it still C commands everything after it. And one yeah. way of thinking about how to do that, I mean, then the, the other part of the puzzle is how do you get the reflexive marker antecedent by this thing? Uh, but mm -hmm. there's two parts of the puzzle. One part is that the, uh, the, the nominal uh, ver verb and nominal, nominalized verb has to have originated lower and, and rid written up the uh, uh, spine of the nominal. And that's uh, already something proposed by uh, Mickey Carstens. And so it's not hard to justify that. Uh, but the mm -hmm. odd thing is, is having the associative marked nominal still counting as a C commander. Now you're, you're saying it's got to count as a C commander. And I agree with that. And the question is how to execute that. And one of the ideas I had uh, is that maybe the associative marker is introduced by uh, pair merges and affix directly. Uh, and so if it's introduced by pair merge, that means it's still a nominal and therefore still uh, uh, C commanding. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, since we already have pair merge in theory and uh, basically we're using it every time we do head movement because head movement is essentially pair, pair merge uh, because you uh, take on the uh, category of the thing you would join to. Um, okay. And so, 
so this is just external pair merge, right? Um, and uh, so what if you do that um, to these kinds of nominals, uh, they're still nominals, but now they have this associative mark on it. Now, what, 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 what work is that doing? Now, in what you've said earlier and earlier work is that, well, maybe uh, Bantu nominals, uh, if they're not, uh, you know, if they uh, don't as it, forget, have the uh, augments, then they're just, they're automatically licensed or something. Uh, but I don't think you want to say that in these cases. Um, so um, you need some other story about, about those, right? Um, yeah, so yeah. if this thing has to be licensed, then presumably that's what the associate mark is doing and in that we converge um, yeah. and, uh, and that it's C commands and that too. Um, uh, but I think that the, the way you look at this, say by comparison with English, uh, you know, uh, the, the introduction of Bill of himself doesn't work very well. And that may simply be because of is, is actually a head, is introduced as a head and not as an associate ah. marker. And so you, you don't get the sick amount uh, in that situation. Uh, so um, that's the way I've been thinking about that particular puzzle. There's a couple of other twists to it, but that's the, the essentials. And uh, it, you know, it's right along the lines of what you're saying. Uh, it's just yeah. a little glitch that, uh, that enables me to get right. the an Afro fact and, uh, and yeah. also the, the basic C command relations that you also want to get for these bound uh, pronouns. Right. That, yeah, that's super interesting to hear because I think I, I've been, yeah, worrying a little bit about the reflexives since you emailed me, but I didn't have anything, yeah, I had nothing to say. And I would want, I guess I would want to be able to say the same thing about the passive too, potentially, even if that's, I mean, you're not going to have the same kind of um, like reciprocal reflexive evidence there, but I, I mean, it just, seems overwhelmingly like it's gotta be kind of the same story. So that seems like- Well, I mean, if you were right about those uh, being uh, uh, introduced on the verbal spine, then we ought to have the same kind of effect raising the, uh, the, yeah. the verb stem past them and still have reflexives on them that be licensed by yeah. those arguments. Uh, so, so you're essentially good. saying, okay, I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, um, so I don't think that's gonna, they're gonna work the same. Um, uh, if you want to do it the way that you're describing for the passive. Um, right. But, uh, you know, that could just be that I'm totally wrong about the nominals, in which case, you know, you don't have to pay attention. But uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm right about that way of handling the, the uh, infinitivals that are, you know, uh, nouny on mm -hmm. the outside and pretty verbal on the inside, except they have an associative NP. And of course, right. the ones that have the associative NP are the ones that aren't selected as complements other than things that are selected as NPs. Right, right. And so that also seems like a relevant factor to consider. Yeah, so yeah, I think, I think so. maybe you're right that, that it's better to separate them out and have that. Yeah, I will think about that more. That I like this idea. Okay. I have, uh, uh, I turned that into a little talk I gave it, you know, at our Rutgers reading group. I'll okay. send you the, the outline. Awesome. It's, it's yeah. really, it's, it's barely baked at all. Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> that sounds, yeah. It's, it's a ball it sounds, of dough. I love barely baked stuff. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Uh, do we have any uh, questions? Uh, any other? Cleo, maybe this is uh, not uh, uh, directly related but like uh, towards the end you talked about Buell's uh, locative inversion and how that might be connect and recently uh, I was uh, checking with a colleague of mine uh, with uh, some of these locative inversion constructions and when we had the object marker instead of like so the verb is transitive and when we had the object marker uh, instead of the full object now Suddenly, oh. local inversion uh, became uh, ungrammatical. Okay. So, but in those situations, oh. so you needed to use a passive uh, construction in order to save that. Uh, the verb yeah. needed to be passivized. Uh, then yeah. the open marker can be there. So it was interesting that the licensing, uh, the locative inversion uh, became like blocked by the presence of the. Huh. Uh, but, but if it were a full 
in situ object, then you could do the inversion. Is that right? Right, right. So that's not a problem. Okay. But once you right. uh, do the object marking, yeah, 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 because there I, are there are cases where even the in situ object will block vocative inversion in some Bantu languages. So it's right, interesting right. Yeah, that it's I don't specifically think specifically about the marker. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know whether that uh, can <laughs> have. I any... wonder if it could. Okay, right. and yeah, right. so I think it is maybe relevant if, um, so you know, there's sort of the question of when does so one one interpretation. Is, so okay, one more question about it: Is there an overt subject in yes, the yes. bad case? Uh, in those okay. uh, situations, we are keeping the overt right. subject. Yeah. <laughs> right, and because that like. Yeah, so so I, I would want to think a lot and maybe try to figure out if we could isolate the true reason of the badness, because it could be that it's just like mm -hmm. in a normal low subject construction, like a transitive active low subject construction. If the subject is low, it's blocking. Yes, and so no. then if that's the case, then it looks a little more different than the passives and the uncontrolled infinitives in that here the subject blocks and mm -hmm. in these other places it doesn't block right, um, right, yeah. but it, yeah I still so I think this is yeah I'm very curious about since I sort of put together um Jochen's analysis with lessons facts and the rest of my stuff I've been thinking about what is it that makes the external argument optional in the first place but mm -hmm. um yeah I gotta yeah that's a yeah. That's a cool fact, and I want to think about that more. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we are thinking about uh, different kind of constructions as well. So maybe if we okay. have more data, like <laughs> I, I should definitely contact yeah. you and like let you know. Yeah. Yeah. We wrote a little snippet uh, about it actually for uh, our oh. fast script. So it's only like two three pages, but it just uh, shows the uh, pattern basically. And uh, so uh, yeah, maybe uh, once awesome. it's uh, finalized, I can. Yeah, once it's finalized, yeah. uh, we can send you the little facts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So good. Uh, does the audience member have some questions like before? Did I miss any? Uh, OK, it seems like uh, <laughs> we don't have uh, uh, questions uh, directly, but uh, we learned a lot about uh, multiple <laughs> issues, and maybe they're shy, so we can uh, oh, sure. uh, and, uh, give yeah. uh, give some time to uh, ask questions after uh, uh, the end of the recording. Uh, and uh, just for the record, I need to acknowledge the funding sources, so just <laughs> please bear with me. Uh, so I'd like to thank the two organization, uh, two organizers, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mista. Uh, the assistants, Paris Fleming and Shigeto Kamano, uh, as well as Liaison IERS Institute of System Michino Suzuki. This event was supported by shared budget of ICU Research Institutes, Institutes of Education Research and Service, and the Linguistic Lab at ICU. Uh, the next part of the colloquium is on January 15th uh, in 2022, and uh, Lee Bigmore from University of Albany uh, will share his research. Yeah, uh, uh, there was some change in the schedule because of the entrance exam uh, uh, issues. Uh, so we at the moment have uh, only one speaker that day. Uh, so any further information, you can find it on the website. And uh, thank you uh, for being here today. And uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to thank you for <laughs> okay, uh, yes, thank the you. organizers for the work they did to get it ready. Yeah, thank yes. you. So we will stop the recording now.